good morning, everybody. Welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name is Tim Baggers. Joined this morning by John Casson, special guest. John, we were discussing your many roles and responsibilities and titles before the stream started. Uh, do us a favor and just explain a little bit about who you are, where you've come from, and what you're doing today. Um, well, thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me on, first of all. I really appreciate it. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, really excited to chat with you for the next little bit. Uh, my name is John Casson. Uh, my current role is I know my title on your um, on your promos was Olympic snowboard coach. I'm currently actually working in the mountain bike industry where I'm the senior coach licensing manager for the National Interscholastic Cycling Association, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit, but my background is I grew up in Northern Virginia and uh, like many folks my age, I moved out west after college and discovered skiing and snowboarding and ended up moving to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, where I started out as a snowboard instructor and then found a little niche as kind of the guy who taught a lot of the tricks and stuff in uh, mm -hmm. snowboarding. And fortunately, I was in a town that actually had one of the few at the time, this is the late 90s, one of the few kind of actual snowboard training programs in the US that actually trained kids to compete. And so I got involved with that program, eventually became the snowboard program director for that, um, for that club. We had about 130-ish kids um, and about 25 coaches. And then there was a need for coaching in the uh, sport of border cross, which is uh, four or six snowboarders going down, like basically a motocross course downhill and competing against each other. And uh, there was a need for some coaches there. So I started coaching border cross and ended up doing that full time for the last uh, probably 10 years of my snow sports career. And uh, was fortunate enough to travel around the world in the World Cup tour with some amazing athletes and, and was fortunate enough to coach at an Olympics in 2014. So, yeah, that's my athletic coaching career so far in a nutshell. Yeah, the one, the, the discipline, by the way, is awesome. I love watching that one on, in the Olympics. It's so exciting because you don't know what's going to happen. The, the question I have is, is coming through that, it's kind of a non-traditional way of, of getting to the Olympics, so to speak, because you, you didn't start out with the, you know, I have a dream where I'm going to be in the Olympics one day as a coach and kind of progress through, but it was just kind of a situation where you found yourself in the right place at the right time, maybe, and, mm -hmm. and had the experiences that allowed you to, to get there. When we, when we look at traditional coaching, one would would think that you came through and you are a you know you represent an organization and that organization hires you is that how that worked for you or were you considered a private coach uh well actually kind of, a little bit of both that's a really good question so we were a private club even though it was a community-based club in steamboat springs colorado um as going to the olympics typically you're part of a national team. So my Olympic experience is I was brought on board with the Australian Olympic team because I was working with two Australian athletes. So I was officially a member of the Australian team there. Huh. The World Cup tour is also typically na nation-based as well, but I was there not as a member of the US team because they usually had mixed athletes from various countries. So in that respect, I was a private coach even though I was employed by the club. So it was a little bit of a hybrid of of both those uh, both those aspects. Were there any were there any ethical challenges involved where you're working for a, a nation and yet working for private athletes who may not represent that nation? No, um, nothing, nothing uh, extraordinary in that respect because everybody is still, at the end of the day, it's still an individual sport. Um, okay. It's not a team-based sport. So I can work with a uh, Australian athlete who's competing against an American athlete that I'm coaching both of them. Uh, so no, none in that respect. At the end of the day, it's whoever crossed the finish line first. Um, even if you're coaching two U.S. athletes, they could they could see each other in the finals of an event. So no, not in that respect. No. Well, I'm I'm incredibly jealous of the fact that you got to go to the Olympics and, and be part of that and, and the experience. Really, seriously, <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about what that experience was like going to the Olympics and just being part of that big stage and 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 also having athletes succeed at that stage. You know, like it, it's interesting because I think you said this earlier. I had, as a kid, every kid dreams of going to the Olympics at some yeah. point. Not when I was 10, you know, I wasn't dreaming about going to the Olympics as a coach. Who knew that there were even coaches at the Olympics? Right. So that year was the, the year that I coached at the Olympics was 2013, 2014. So the Sochi Olympics in Russia. And I was working with four athletes that were attempting to make the respective teams two US athletes and two Australian athletes. Unfortunately, the two US athletes didn't meet the US qualification, weren't able to attend. And as I said, I was brought on by the Australian team to work with these two Australians. 
And it was um, arriving and going through the processing and all those little things that go on, kind of go on behind the scenes are really overwhelming, but they're really cool. Cause you're like, I'm at the Olympics. And even though you have to wait in line for like an hour to get your credential and go through these seven steps of security and all these different things, it was still such a cool experience. And you get to the village and you get checked in and you, you open up your your uh, wardrobe in the in, in in the village and you've got all this gear and there's boxes of olympic gear and it's such a cool experience even if it is quite overwhelming you're killing me right now you just <laughs> <laughs> um but then like you get to the, the first couple of days you're just wide-eyed and it's crazy you're wearing your credential and it's so cool and and it's so overwhelming but then you get to the top of the venue and it's the same. It's the same people that you've been on the World Cup tour with. It's the same coaches. You might be wearing a different jacket. Um, the the setting, the venue is set up a little bit differently. But at the end of the day, you go about your business and you go about your job. And I didn't find that part of it particularly overwhelming or unique. It was like it was weird. Once I got in that bubble of the border cross track, it was like it was, I could kind of breathe and relax. Okay, it's business time. It's this is what we do. This is what we've done for the years to prepare and. Here we go. It's e it was kind of, I wouldn't say easy, but it was it was relaxing once we got to the top of the track. At least for me, I can't speak for my athletes. <laughs> but I was going to ask a little bit about about anxiety because there's obviously a lot of pressure, right? It's it's the biggest stage. World Cup events are you know one after the other after the other to some extent. Uh, do do you ever get nervous for your athletes, or is it uh, you know they've got this? Oh gosh, every time, every time. Uh, I try not to show it, but every time they're they're in that start gate, I get I get butterflies in my stomach. But you know what, Tim? That's what I live for. That's what mm -hmm. makes coaching exciting is to get them to that point where their hands touch the start gate handles, and it's on them. And you've done everything you can possibly to prepare them for that moment, whether it's a small race or an Olympics, and let them go. And as a coach, of course you're nervous. You know you want them to succeed, and and of course you got some little butterflies in there. Like it's not in a bad way. It's a fun anxiety. It's like that yeah. excitement. excitement. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 what makes it worthwhile. So yeah, yeah, I love it. The looking at in terms of of being a coach, a lot of well, maybe not a lot, but but some people when I tell them what I do for a living and and you know train train coaches, you can make a living from that is is a question I get a lot. And and here you are, that's something you've done. Can you talk a little bit about? you know, your experiences and some of the challenges, I guess, of, of earning a living as a coach and how you were able to do it successfully? Well, well gosh, that's a, that's a really good question. I remember the first time my, my wife and I were dating and we went home to meet her family and, and um, they come from a more traditional sports background. And mm -hmm. my brother asked me, so, so what do you do? And it's kind of like this odd, you know, people like outside Olympic sports don't know oftentimes that there's coaches behind there. And, uh, and yeah, it's really challenging, especially in snow sports. There's not a ton of, well, there's not a ton of, of financial resources in any of the snow sports. So to make a living doing it is really challenging. You have to kind of, for a while, I was working summer jobs and mm. uh, trying to make ends meet during the summertime, but I loved what I was doing and it, and it drove me to continue doing it during the wintertime and not really worry about that aspect too much. At this point in my career, I can, I can do okay. I'm not, you know, I'm not an NFL coach flying around on private jets. Um, Many of us do not. No, no, not many are. Not many get that opportunity. But uh, you know, able to make a make enough of a living that that is uh, that allows me to to enjoy life the way I like to enjoy life, which is fairly simple. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's it was a challenge, but it, it worked out. When when we look at, at coaching as a whole, you know, financials, you know, earning a living from it can be a challenge. What are some of the other challenges that you've experienced as a coach? And you've talked about it a little bit being an individual sport. Do you do you find that a challenge in that maybe you don't have the the support network of having assistant coaches or or others who are around you to to make a team of coaches? Well, that's certainly one of the biggest challenges, particularly in the in the private club environment that I was in. We didn't have a lot of resources to provide a an equipment manager. We call wax tech. Mm -hmm in the in the snow sports world service man we didn't really have that um the funding to be able to do that or have assistant coaches so that was challenging but probably the biggest challenge and I, probably for every coach is the travel and the hours really yeah i mean from that again that olympic year from 2013 to 2014 from november 1st to about mid-april i think i was home for 18 days in about a five and a half month period 
And that's not 18 days consecutively. That's two days home and then back on the road and four days home and back on the road. So that's really, really challenging is that time away from home. And then when you're on the road, when you don't have that support system, it's 24 seven, you are the, you're the guy who's coordinating meals. You're the guy who's coordinating travel. You're the sports psychologist. You're the physical trainer. You're the, uh, you know, you're the person that, <laughs> whose shoulder they get to cry on at times. Mm -hmm. uh, you're the wax technician. You're the one loading the van with their help, of course, and, and making sure that everything runs on time. Like it's, it's a 18, 20 hour a day job. There was five days, five, six days straight where, you know, you're living on four or five hours of sleep and it's, it's, it, it's can fry you pretty quick. Yeah. So how did you, how did you navigate that? If, if that's true and, and it, it can't, you can cause burnout. How did you avoid that process? Did you have any strategies in place to just get away or de-stress? Yeah, for sure. So ironically, uh, I always looked at my time in the wax room when I was preparing the athlete's equipment. Um, that was my kind of time away where I could put on my headphones. It was a good four or five, sometimes six or seven hours worth of work a night um, to do that work. Um, but I put on my headphones, I could zone out, listen to music, I could reflect on my day, reflect on what tomorrow is going to look like, make plans for what tomorrow is going to look like. It was kind of my alone quiet time. And I really tried to make it that. Of course, you're in a room with, with other technicians and there's some banter going on and mm -hmm. there's some interaction there. But that was kind of some fun, relaxed time. And then when I was home, I really tried to like put work away and not deal with work and just spend time with my spouse in the off season. First thing we do when the when the season's over is go home and take a week long trip riding mountain bikes somewhere. Uh, fortunately, my wife um, was super supportive through this whole time. I did try and call her every day, mm -hmm. uh, even if it was just say hi. I'm doing fine. I got to run. Um, so that her voice honestly was was really helpful too. So yeah, I, I employed quite a few strategies that that helped me stay sane. And and to keep just to back up a little bit, that 2013-14 season because it was the Olympic year. Um, we were able to bring an assistant coach to the World Cup um, events. And we only had four athletes that year. So it was with two coaches and four athletes, it certainly took quite a bit of the stress away. But previous years was me rolling solo, and that was tough. <laughs> yeah, wow. The There's definitely a challenge there in, in terms of juggling time management. And it, you mentioned sleep being yeah. a, an issue as well. If if you look at your sport and and what you were doing, what this is a hard question to ask because I don't think there is a right answer. But what would your typical day look like at an event? You 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 know fly out to to Austria or somewhere. You you have an event. What would your typical day look like for you getting your athlete ready? Uh, well, each day of an event is is actually fairly different. Um, so arrival day is getting yourself set up, is getting yourself. And I usually try to arrive a day or two early to get either acclimated to time change if you're coming over from the U.S. or just be able to set up our space, uh, figure out where on our accommodations, where food was, where where we we're going to set up any exercise equipment if they had a gym. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of arrival day. Usually a little bit mellower. Get the wax room set up. Sometimes you have to fight for space. So getting there a little bit early to make sure you can carve out the corner that you need in the wax room. Right. <laughs> that was important. But on a typical like training day, you're up at, depending on how long your commute is to get to the ski area, 6 a.m. at breakfast at 6.30 or 7, out the door at 7.30 or 8, up to the hill. Uh, you, you inspect the course first, which is slowly slipping through and kind of looking at the features and looking at the layout of the track. Uh, back up a uh, few hours of training. Sometimes they'll split male versus female training. So the males might train first or females and then another training block for the, for the women or mm -hmm. men, depending on how they shuffle that around. Back to the lodging, uh, shooting video all day long. So the first thing to do is get your video dumped into your computer, set a time with the athletes, get them going on their afternoon stretch and exercise routine, set some video time either before or after dinner, and then get in the wax room and start working on gear. And um, usually from 6 a.m. until sometimes midnight, you're kind of going nonstop. That video com that video component is really important because um, being able to watch not only what the athletes are doing, but also what other athletes are doing, what lines they're taking that are fast. So trying to spend as much time on video as you can um, while still knowing you got to be in the wax room for a few hours. So that was, it was definitely challenging at the time. Now, coaches who work in the national team environment typically have more resources and they'll have their own wax technician who will take care of all the the equipment management so the coaches could then spend more time on working directly with the athletes. So I'm just speaking more from a, from a position as kind of a private 
coach rolling solo. <laughs> yeah. Well, and as a private coach, the, the responsibilities that you have are, are incredible. The fact that you just have to cover and be have expertise in so many different areas and be able to juggle all those effectively. Is is this a, a situation where part of your part of your salary is dependent on your athletes' performances, or do you get? I'm, I'm being nosy here, but <laughs> this is new to me, and I'm and I'm curious. Is it you know if your athlete does well, you do well, or do you just this is your salary, and hopefully your athletes do well regardless? No, there's there's I've never worked in an environment where there's any sort of of bonus, um, bait, for, at least from a payroll perspective, bonus based on performance. Sometimes the athletes, if they win any money, might buy you dinner, <laughs> <laughs> maybe take you out for a beer or two if they do well. Um, but generally speaking, there's not a whole lot of incentive uh, from a monetary perspective. Okay, so it comes down to your in, you know internal motivation to do all those little things well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the connection with the athletes, honestly, like you just really pour yourself into doing whatever you can to help them be successful. And a couple of the athletes that I've worked with who've, who've actually been really successful in the sport I've known since they were, since they were kids. One I started working with and he was nine or 10 years old and the other one he was 13. Mm -hmm. So, and they're both 29 and 25 now today. So, you know, spent 10 years with those guys and you can create a connection and you just want to do everything you can to help them get better. So a couple of questions in line with that as an individual coach. Uh, the first is, as an individual coach, how do you draw the line between being their coach and their friend, knowing that you, you, you spend so much time and sometimes you have to tell them things they don't want to hear, yeah. right? And then, and then from within that, looking at you being the coach and then being an athlete, how do you deal with an athlete who maybe you invest everything you can into them, but they don't, um, they don't utilize it the way that they should and they don't live up to their potential? Oh my God, that, that, this question could take us the rest of the time, Tim. <laughs> I mean, it's one, I, it's one I struggle with, right? You, you give so much to an athlete and then, you know, they don't appreciate the talent that they maybe have or they yeah. take it for granted. And so they never really achieve that greatness or, or they don't maybe – value what you're trying to give them and you know personally i know that that kind of hurts and you know how do you deal with that um well let's let, let's kind of uh take the first part of your question first and that's the relationship with the athletes and, mm -hmm. and it's a really interesting question because i see it evolve over time <clears throat> excuse me and your relationship with as a you know an adult athlete to say teenagers or preteens is very different than it is when you're an adult athlete working with adult i'm sorry adult coach working with adult athletes mm -hmm. um i think at that earlier stage when they're younger you have to set those expectations and you have to you can be friendly with an athlete and be positive and open and create that mm -hmm. trust relationship but it has to be very clear who's in charge and and who is who is not um, as that evolves and kids get older and they get into their their late teens and 20s and you start to evolve, it becomes much more of a collaborative relationship and you're respecting each other's roles. And they respect uh, my role as the coach um, and having to tell them some difficult things at times, but also I respect their role as the athlete and they've got work to do too. And it becomes very symbiotic and collaborative. And if you respect each other's roles, then it... Um, then it works out really well. So last year, for example, I was kind of private coaching again with a couple of 24 and 25 year old athletes. And so these guys are pretty mature adults, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> I use the term mature loosely. <laughs> um, but we had this very collaborative relationship and they certainly respected my viewpoint and my experience as a coach. I respected their abilities as an athlete and it didn't feel like anybody was in charge. It felt like we worked really, really closely together, but we were really respectful of each other's roles in that in that in that relationship. And it worked out awesome. It was it was a really cool experience, and and um, loved working with those guys. Um, second part of your question is is athletes that um, that you can't quite create that connection with to get them to realize that potential, and it's really challenging, and it's really it's really difficult because you keep trying to find like that opening and you keep trying to find that thing that's going to pry the door open. And sometimes it just, it's just not there it, or, 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 you know, the lever isn't there. I'm not saying that it's not there, but whatever you're trying to do to pry open that, that box for them, is just not working for whatever reason. 
and it gets real challenging. And you just try and, as a coach, you just try and find as many strategies as you can, try and attack it from as many different angles, try and have open, honest conversations if you can, um, and just try and build that trust because that's the key to unlocking that box is, is that trust relationship. And if you can't quite get that trust going, it, it's just not going to work. And I've definitely been in those situations where it just hasn't worked and athletes have gone to different programs or I've moved on and done some different things. And um, hopefully it never comes to that, but sometimes that's the ultimate outcome. It's just not the right fit. Mm. And as a private coach, there's, there's that balance between this isn't working out versus I need to get paid. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. This is, this is my vocation. So, so is there, is there some kind of level or tipping point where you go, you know what, this is, it's just not worth this. This is part of my salary. This is my job, but the, the, I guess the, the outcomes over here aren't occurring the way I want them to occur. And it's affecting other things. Maybe. I, I don't know. I don't know that you have an answer. It's just kind of a, maybe more of a discussion about this is a challenge I think for, for private coaches. No, and I think that's a really, really amazing point because nobody really talks about kind of the financial side of things. And, and it's, it's fortunately when I was working for the steamboat club, um, we were a large enough club that, uh, that we could, we never actually got to this point, but we could tell parents or, or athletes like, you know, this just isn't right the program for you mm -hmm. and it wouldn't really affect the financial side of things too greatly. Mm -hmm. um, but then as a later on, the subsequent couple of years as a private coach, it was certainly a factor, but I think you have to have the courage and integrity to be able to stand on your actions and let your actions do the, do the talking. And if, if an athlete and you just aren't a good fit to have that, have that honest conversation, it's like, look, this isn't quite the right, area for you. Here's another coach. Here's another program that might work better for you and have the courage and, and integrity to, to be honest with them and, and let them move on to do something that is going to help them be successful. And then the financial considerations, if you operate in that space and that space of integrity and honesty and have that reputation, one person might leave, but two people might come in and you just have to kind of have faith in the process and faith in your integrity. And it's, mm -hmm. it's challenging for sure. Cause you're like, uh Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna have any kids left, but I guess it's kind of those things. If you get to a point where you're telling every kid that this isn't the right fit and you move on to a different program and then you maybe got to look at internally and be like, well, if I'm not a good fit for 90% of my team, maybe it's me. <laughs> do you ever, do you ever as a, <clears throat> a coach, um, look back on your, your own athletic careers and feel like, uh, you, you could have maybe done more? Or, or been a better athlete knowing what you know now as a coach? Yeah, I think so. I mean, my athletic career, it, this I have a really interesting path to being a coach because I wasn't really much of, a, of an athlete in the traditional sense growing up. I skateboarded, I mountain biked, um, and I ran track. And I wasn't a particularly uh, great uh, track athlete. I was actually consistent and well-rounded, but not particularly great. I could do a lot of things okay, but not one thing great. But in terms of of those things, I would have, looking back, I probably would have uh, had a little more focus in the, in, the, uh, in the track world and probably maybe understood what it was like to be more coachable. Um, I had a great track coach. He was a big influence on me. Um, and my first year was not all that awesome, but the last next couple of years worked out pretty well, in my opinion. And uh, I really enjoyed what I did. But I think looking back, I'd be a little more coachable and a little more understanding what the big picture was. And then in terms of the individual sports that I did, I might have just pursued them a little bit more and not seen them just as a, as a hobby. But this is hey, something that's really cool and understood the lessons that I was learning from that. Because on reflection now at the age of X number of years and looking back, I know what those sports taught me. But at the time, I, they were just kind of fun things to do. And, and I think having a bigger picture perspective um, at the time might have been, uh, might have been a little more motivating, a little more focusing, might have driven me a little bit harder. Something I hear in, in the coaching world is, is this expectation that in order for you to be an elite level coach, you have to have been an elite level athlete because then you've walked in their shoes and you know what it's like, et cetera, et cetera. And that's that's kind of why I asked that question, because I think there's a lot of coaches who who haven't you know been to the Olympics and won a gold medal, but have become very, very successful coaches. So as, as a coach yourself, how do you how do you navigate those challenges of, of not having done some of the things that you're asking the athletes to do? And how do you earn that respect 
of we're going to listen to you, even though we know that you've not accomplished the things that you're asking us to do? Well, and certainly that's that's uh, that's a great, great question, because I have not ridden a board across track at um, 45 miles an hour at the at a World Cup caliber. I've ridden some smaller ones, but it's not, it's not been close to the same. Mm. Um, I haven't competed at that level. I haven't competed at the Olympics. Um, uh, so I, from a technical perspective, I don't really know what it's like to ride at that speed, uh, at that speed on a track like that. From a performance perspective, I haven't been an athlete at that level. So the way I've tried to tackle that is by uh, having people on my staff that have had that experience. So for example, the Olympic year, a couple of the guys that were helping me out did have that Olympic experience and were former athletes. So they could fill that that hole, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, like what's what's enabled me to earn the respect of athletes competing at that level is the fact that I listen. And the fact that I, I'm not the coach that tells them what to do, but I try and create a collaborative environment where you're the one doing it on the track. Tell me what you feel, what you think. I'm the one watching what you're doing and what the other athletes are doing. Here's what I'm seeing is going on. Let's figure out a solution together. Mm. And so I've never been a very dictatorial, controlling, do this command type of coach. It's always tried to be very collaborative. And I think that's how I can overcome some of that is truly listening uh, and observing and trying to understand what's going on, but but in, but really trying to listen and understand what the athletes are saying about what they're feeling out on the track. It's a great point. And, and I think anybody who's listening, who is early on in their career, perhaps the reputation of your athletic experiences is more important than as you age in and become more and more experienced. I think you would agree with that, right? As you become known as an expert coach, less attention is given to, well, what was their athletic career, right? Like, for sure. For sure. And, and I, got, I was fortunate enough to get in on this, uh, the sport of border cross in a fairly early stage, um, just as it was announced that it was going to be an Olympic sport. Um, and so I was able to, and I was able to work with some athletes as they kind of moved up through the ranks. Um, so I started working with athletes that were 12 and 13 years old. And I kind of followed them through the North American tour and through junior world championships and into the world cup and then to the Olympics. So I was able to learn and grow right alongside with them as well. So, and then once you're there and have done it, then you kind of have the experience and to some degree, the reputation as being, being uh, capable of, of leading a team at that level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you're just joining us, we're talking with John Casson. If you have questions for him about coaching in general or specifically winter sports, be sure to put them in your chat box. But I want to move on because you're not just doing winter sports now. You've you've moved into something else. Talk a little bit about what you're doing now. Uh, yeah, so I've kind of um, fully pun intended switched gears. And <laughs> I mentioned before, my other path in life has been mountain biking and I'm currently working for the National Interscholastic Cycling Association which manages and oversees um, high school mountain bike leagues around the country. We're in 31 different states we call leagues and uh, have about 30,000 athletes and about 11,000 coaches. I'm the uh, coach licensing manager, senior coach licensing manager, so in charge of all the coach education programs. And to back up and, and, and throw a little background in there, I did take a break from snowboard coaching for three years and work for the US Ski and Snowboard team as the director of education and coach education manager. So I've actually kind of parallel to the snowboarding career. I've also done quite a bit of work in the coach education space in snowboarding and now in mountain biking. So yeah, switched gears and gone into mountain biking. And, and mountain biking isn't just this random sport. You, you, we talked before the show that you're a big mountain biker and always have been. Yep, yeah, I started mountain biking before I started snowboarding. Um, and actually mm -hmm. mountain biking that, that inspired me to move out west after college. Um, and that's when I picked up snowboarding just Kind of right place right time to make snowboarding a career snowboard coaching a career and then the opportunity came up to move into the mountain bike realm in um kind of late of last year and uh i kind of jumped at the at the chance so it was cool well you're unique because you've been a private coach you've also coached for for you know a national team you've been across different levels and different sports if i can pick your brains from a coaching education point of view where do you think coaches are lacking when it comes to what they need to know? If I'm offering a coach education program, what should I be teaching them that, that you see is lacking in coaching uh, at the moment? I have fundamental coaching skills, like communication and connection skills. I think a lot of, you know, as, as director of education for the US ski team, I spent a lot of time in some conferences at the USOPC and working with coach education directors 
from other sports. And we all agree that typically uh, if there's any education for a coach in youth sports, it's very skills based and very technical based. And people think you need to be a technical expert in order to coach basketball. You've got to have played basketball and understand the X's and O's. Oftentimes in youth sports and the younger the kids are, it has, it has almost zero to do with the skills. I won't say zero, but that's just a small part of it. It's getting, it's inspiring kids to be passionate about the sport. It's inspiring kids to have set goals and understand how to achieve them. So it's kind of those soft coaching skills that I think are lacking, particularly in youth sports. What about, what about professional sports or not? I mean, youth sports can be, it depends on the age, but in terms of, you know, a professional coach like you rather than, you know, a volunteer coach in a, a peewee league? Um, you know, at the, at kind of the highest levels, I think it's, it's along the same lines. You end up like starting to look at kind of your coach philosophy and what it means to be a coach and what motivates you to be a coach at that level. You, you, you asked before about kind of performance bonuses. It's definitely mm -hmm. not most sports. It's definitely not about the money. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of understanding why you do it, what motivates you and drives you to do it and how that can reflect in your team culture and team philosophy. Uh, I think that's a big thing. That's a hot topic, right? As we know right now in, in a lot of sports is team culture, but how to actually facilitate that and how to actually build it and how to actually create the, uh, to use a term in the industry right now, athlete centered model without it being athlete led, but being centered around the athlete, but culture driven. And I think that's uh, that's something that has been proven to be effective in a lot of organizations. You look at at the great sports organizations that are out there, uh, the Golden State Warriors, San Antonio Spurs, and they have a very definitive team culture. Mm. And facilitating and building that is a uh, is a skill that takes years of experience. And I think at that highest level, that's the thing that can really bring out the greatness in athletes and really bring out. Uh, that ability to go to the next step and really truly go from being pretty good to being a world champion in whatever you're doing is that culture and motivation that drives everybody. And, uh, and that's a, that's a difficult thing to do at that high level. It's, it's great advice and, and great suggestions for anybody who wants to get into coaching or, or improving coaching. So if, if we look at young coaches or coaches who are looking to get into a sport or move up in the sport Given your experiences, what kind of advice would you have for them beyond working on the culture and philosophy? Well, make, well first of all, is make sure you love doing it. Make sure you you're, you're make sure you love working with people. It's not about your sport necessarily. You're not about the sport, but get into it because you love working with people and you want to you want you truly desire to see people get better and improve. And that's if if you really truly believe that, then coaching it can be right can be the right path for you. Uh, beyond that, uh, be open-minded, be intellectually curious, read books, keep yeah. your eyes open, listen to everything that's around you. Every, I always refer to it as the buffet. You can pick and choose. The, everything's laid out in front of you. It's all there. Your peers as coaches, the athletes, parents, anything is a learning experience. It's just up to you to pick out which ones are going are gonna to fit your philosophy and fit your outlook. Um, even stuff that don't, you know, if you don't like bananas, you can put them on your plate anyway. <laughs> uh, and just take all of that in and filter it all and use everything you do as a learning experience. Take that time to reflect, whether it's a really small moment um, or a big moment, and whether it's a successful moment or an unsuccessful moment, it's always a learning experience. And that would be my advice to coaches getting in is to treat everything as a learning experience and understand what motivates you, that it's not about the sport, it's about uh, helping people around you and helping the people that you're working with become better at their sport. Also, be, be better people, be better humans, particularly at a young age. So it was a bit of a rambling answer. So hopefully I summarized it okay. Well, one of the things I, I kind of wanted to, to identify is what you said about a banana. And you, you're talking about picking and choosing what works for you in the philosophy. And then you said, take a banana, even if you don't like it. And I thought about that and I thought, you're right. We, we sometimes read the books that we're most interested in. We, we study the topics that, that we, we enjoy studying, but sometimes we have to, to look at the things that we don't enjoy the most, but are things that we need to know or, or things that we need to change as ourselves, as coaches. Those are important too. And mm -hmm. so be sure to, to kind of pile on a bit of everything rather than, well, I'm just interested in this area and I'm gonna take that and leave that because that's not as fun. Right. Uh, that's a great point. It's a great point. 
John, uh, thank you so much for, for talking to us. If somebody wants to reach out with a, a question, follow up with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, well, my email is fairly easy. It's my name, john.casson at outlook.com. It's uh, right there at the bottom of the screen. And I, I love talking coaching. I love talking youth development. I love talking sports. So anybody out there is listening, um, mom, <laughs> drop me a line, <laughs> ask me a question. <laughs> well, I, again, I can't thank you enough for, for him. Like it's well known amongst my athletes that I absolutely cannot stand bananas. So if any of my former athletes are listening, they probably chuckled at that, at that reference. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to share a little bit of your experiences with us. I, I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me, Tim. Like I said, I love talking about this stuff and I really appreciate you, uh, you having me on. It was great. My pleasure. Well, everybody, just a reminder, coming up tomorrow, we have a double header, two shows for you. 11 a.m., Chris Babb is the college director of sport media at a university in Arkansas. He's also a former high school athletic director. He'll be talking about both of those roles and his experiences in those. And then in the afternoon at 2.30 Eastern, Charlie Ward, uh, the Heisman winner, the only Heisman winner to ever uh, win the Heisman and then go pro play professionally in another sport Um like the NBA. So he'll be talking. He's also a head coach of basketball in a high school. So we'll talk about football. We'll talk about pro basketball. And then we'll also talk about being a coach in high schools. But on behalf of myself, Tim Baggerst and John Kasson, th thanks so much for watching.